high again. We're in chapter 13 of John Stott's commentary on Acts. Paul in Athens, that takes up verses 16 to 34 of chapter 17. I've always considered the Acts speech, what do we want to call it? It seems to be impromptu, but well thought through, so maybe Paul had been preparing his mind for this day. Is it a speech? Is it a sermon? Whatever it is, it's a masterpiece of Christian apologetics and theology. So here's Stott's commentary on that section of, of the book of Acts. There's something enthralling about Paul in Athens, the great Christian apostle amid the glories of ancient Greece. Of course, he had known about Athens since his boyhood. Everybody knew about Athens. Athens had been the foremost Greek city-state since the 5th century BC. Even after its incorporation into the Roman Empire, it retained a proud intellectual independence and also became a free city. It boasted of its rich philosophical tradition inherited from Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, of its literature and art, and of its notable achievements in the cause of human liberty. Even if, in Paul's day, it lived on its great past and was a comparatively small town by modern criteria, it still had an unrivaled reputation as the empire's intellectual metropolis. Now, for the first time, Paul visited the Athens of which he had heard so much, arriving by sea from the north. His friends, who had given him a safe escort from Berea, had gone. He had asked them to send Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. He was hoping to be able to return to Macedonia, for it was to Macedonia that he had been called, according to 16 verse 10. Meanwhile, as he waited for their arrival, he found himself alone in the cultural capital of the world. What was his reaction? What should be the reaction of a Christian who visits or lives in a city which is dominated by a non-Christian ideology or religion, a city which may be aesthetically magnificent and culturally sophisticated, but morally decadent and spiritually deceived or dead? There were four parts to Paul's reaction. Luke tells us what he saw, what he felt, what he did, and what he said. First, what Paul saw. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, that is, for Silas and Timothy, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols, or given over to idolatry. Of course, he could have walked around Athens as a tourist, as we would probably have done, in order to see the sights of the town. He could have been determined, now that at last he had the opportunity, to do Athens thoroughly, and ticket spectacles one by one. For the buildings and monuments of Athens were unrivaled. The Acropolis, the town's ancient citadel, which was elevated enough to be seen from miles around, has been described as one vast composition of architecture and sculpture dedicated to the national glory and to the worship of the gods. Even today, although now a partial ruin, the Parthenon has a unique grandeur. Or Paul could have lingered in the Agora with its many porticos painted by famous artists in order to listen to the debates of its contemporary statesmen and philosophers, for Athens was well known for its democracy. And Paul was no uncultured Philistine. In our terms, he was a graduate of the universities of Tarsus and Jerusalem, and God had endowed him with a massive intellect. So he might have been spellbound by the sheer splendor of the city's architecture, history, and wisdom. Yet it was none of these things which struck him. First and foremost, what he saw was neither the beauty nor the brilliance of the city, but its idolatry. The adjective Luke uses occurs nowhere else in the New Testament and has not been found in any other Greek literature. Although most English versions render it full of idols, the idea conveyed seems to be that the city was under them. We might say that it was smothered with idols or swamped by them. Alternatively, since kata words often express luxurious growth, what Paul saw was a veritable forest of idols. As he was later to say, the Athenians were very religious. That's verse 22. Xenophon referred to Athens as one great altar, one great sacrifice. In consequence, there were more gods in Athens than in all the rest of the country, and the Roman satirist hardly exaggerates when he says that it was easier to find a god there than a man. 
there were innumerable temples, shrines, statues, and altars. In the Parthenon stood a huge golden ivory statue of Athena, whose gleaming spear point was visible 40 miles away. Elsewhere, there were images of Apollo, the city's patron, of Jupiter, Venus, Mercury, Bacchus, Neptune, Diana, and Asclepius, that is, the healing god. The whole Greek pantheon was there, all the gods of Olympus, and they were beautiful. They were made not only of stone and brass, but of gold, silver, ivory, and marble, and they had been elegantly fashioned by the finest Greek sculptures. There's no need to suppose that Paul was blind to their beauty. But beauty did not impress him if it did not honor God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, he was oppressed by the idolatrous use to which the God-given artistic creativity of the Athenians was being put. This is what Paul saw, a city submerged in its idols. Next time, what Paul felt. <laughs>